you know, to the left, it's still a little, a little bit in the right. And so if you go all the way with it, you're just dedicated, you're committing to it. And it's not like kind of like still like so subtly in, on the other side too. So if it's like a, something that's like, in, like two guitar tracks playing the same part, I just pan one hard left and one hard right. And I do that with like, you know, vocal doubles if there's two, um, usually the, the stuff that I don't hard pan that I might just do it just to a little bit or like, per, like tambourines or shakers or something like that. I might just like put it slightly yeah. off to the side or sometimes like a vocal double. I'll like pan it slightly off to the side, but th- I think that's I, things just sort of jump out when they're like just dedicated into one speaker. And, uh, I think too, it forces you to like make commitments and decisions and like, be like, all right, this is going to live here. And I think it's helps me, uh, knit, like, with my EQs and stuff too, like if, if two different elements are both in the left, you know, that they each need to have their own sonic space still. So, um, it's, that's been interesting, like kind of carving out the frequencies and like, you know, making elements and instruments and sounds fit with each other. So that's, that's sort of a, a, a big one that I, that I've really been enjoying with, with panning. But, uh, as far as templates, there's a couple things that I'll, I'll usually like pop on, like, I have like a, a kick drum channel for, for instance, like if I'm tracking something with my drums at, at the studio, like I know this preset that I made on my kick, well, you know, I'll pull that up cause it sounds great, you know, each time. And so there's like starting points and stuff that I'll, that I'll use, but I haven't actually made like a full, full blown mixing template that I just like pull up and go, go off of. A lot of times I, I mix the stuff that I'm mixing is what I recorded. So I kind of mix as I go, sort of, if I'm tracking the whole thing. Um, yeah. Like I, I track with plugins and stuff on, like it, I don't wait until the, the end, you know? Um, yeah. So I don't know. A lot of times, yeah, it's, I do it as I go. And, um, I definitely, How do you deal with the CPU issues when you're doing that? Uh, well, a couple years ago I, I bought a new computer, like a, an, an iMac and I, I purposefully just got the most like beast machine I could get yeah. at the time. Cause, uh, my old computer before that, I mean, I would just run into like s- system overloads like constantly when a session started to get big and it just drove me crazy. Uh, so I definitely yeah. like shelled out a little bit extra just to get a thing that had a beast processor in it. Getting a strong computer is like the first, <laughs> surprisingly the most important thing. In I know. Some senses, I, I mean, you know? it's so necessary. Like I would have sessions on my old one and like someone would be in the middle of like a take and you know, you get that system overload message and it's just like, I was like, man, this is not professional. You know? Like you just couldn't down that all the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's certain ones though, like certain obviously plugins that are like way more intensive, but, uh, those I, I tend to stay away from until the end, you know, but, uh, I mean, basic stuff like EQ and compression and like reverb or whatever is, is usually doesn't give me too many problems. Yeah. So you're not like, you're not so worried about like the, you know, the flow of the, of the audio and how it's going to go or you just kind of like do it as you go. Meaning, yeah, it's not all yeah. set up in advance. It's just like, yeah, yeah. Because I, I try to just approach every song or mix like you know from a unique way. Like I, I don't really slap the same thing on everything and send it on its way. I, I find on my master bus, I tend to use a lot of the same plugins, but just obviously with the settings ap- appropriate for the mix. You know, like I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the API twenty five hundred compressor as my master bus compression. Um, really? Sometimes I'll use the SSL. Uh, it just depends on these are like the waves or whatever. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like I like the J thirty seven tape machine on on the master. Uh, usually like the slate tape machine. I'll I'll use both of them. Um, and then I usually use like Isotopes Ozone to to like fit, that's the last thing to finish it out. Um, Even if you're sending out to mastering, yeah, I'll do it for like like dynamic EQ, uh, overall EQ, and like imaging, and then. I usually mix with, with a limiter on just to sort of like get it in the ballpark of like what it'll feel like and sound like fit, like when it's mastered. But I take all the limiters off and, you know, give them headroom when I send it off to mastering for sure. Right. Wow. Doesn't doesn't it like get fatiguing to like, you know, mix with limiting on or it doesn't bother you? Uh, I, I don't like smash it to where it's like getting reduced, like it's peak reduction like crazy or anything like that. I like to get it in the in the ballpark of what it'll feel like just so... I, I kind of know what I'm working with dealing with, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, are you, are you, are you referencing a lot of tracks when you're mixing or it's just kind of like you have a vision and you're going for it? I actually don't reference like at all. Usually sometimes we'll, we will for like a, like an, uh, inspiration or like a vibe, but, um, yeah. you know, I, 
that's probably something I should maybe do more often. I just never do. Like I just mix it until I feel like I don't know what else I would do with it. You know, it's such an interesting thing to like, you could tinker with a mix like endlessly. You know what I mean? There's always something you could like change or play around with. I try to just get it to where it feels really good and then like accept it and move on. There's a funny joke that a friend of mine who's an engineer would say, he's like, you don't really ever finish a mix. You just give up eventually. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. There's like that meme on the internet of like the the skeleton on the console. It's like it's like the mission mix is almost finished. It's it's As, it's so true. I mean, you could you could just tinker with it forever. Like there's that famous story about Michael Jackson when they were mixing Billie Jean. They yes. did like 50 something versions of it, you know, and then they ended up going with mix 2. So Yeah. There's something to I think just trusting your gut and like the way it comes out when you just go for it initially and how it made you feel in that moment that I think is important to honor and, and, and respect that instinct because you could just constantly just change things. And sometimes I think if you tinker too much, you make it worse than it was originally, you know? So, yeah, that's something I suffer from a lot. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Do you, do you think that you have like a, a trademark sound, something that like people go to you for? I think mixing is my strongest element in the in the process. So I think that's probably where I like show up the most as far as like how, you know how I'm contributing to a project or, or you know not that I brush off into the other aspects of record making, but I think that's uh, mixing is is it's definitely my favorite aspect of it, and, and I think it's where I it's I think it's the sh- strongest thing that I provide, you know. But like I was saying earlier, though, I, I definitely try not to like get in the way of the way the artist sounds, like putting myself in their sound. I, I definitely always try to serve the artist and serve the song. And I, I don't want people to hear it. And uh, it, it's a tricky thing like to, to be like, oh, that was mixed by or made by so and so. Like, I guess that could be a cool thing. But like it's I also want the artist to sound like the artist. I don't want them to sound like me, you know. Um, I actually asked Matt Garber that one time I was like I, I was curious if because if, since he masters all my projects if there's like a, a unifying theme or if like if he can hear me in the in the record you know some producers have a very specific sound it's like no matter who they work with you know they it comes out with their signature sound on it which which can be a cool thing but I I, I haven't really gone gone down that path too much I don't think yet we'll see yeah I think that's that's super legit um what's it like being a drummer and like getting into like audio like has that how has that affected your 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 mindset as an as an audio engineer obviously groove and rhythm like i the beat is probably what ends up getting developed i would say early on but yeah I, it's interesting i feel like a lot of producers are drummers in some in some ways you're either like a great keyboardist or uh, i guess it's all over the place but um a lot of my, a lot of my I, favorite producers I feel like are, they're all different though. I feel like producers like I'm a bass player and I feel like bass player producers are a very specific type of producer and like a drummer is like a very specific type of producer and yeah. like guitar, you know, like I, I feel like there's less guitar producers than there are the other ones. But but maybe you know, I don't know. That's I think maybe the the guitar ones are probably like great songwriters and and that's why they are good producers as well. Like they know, you know, if 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 you're a great songwriter, you've got a knack for like arrangement and melody and hooks and stuff like that. You know, I used to write songs all the time growing up. Um, that's honestly why I got in a big reason why I got into recording is because I had all these songs, you know, where I, I had all the parts up in my head, you know, and I wanted to be able to express them. So that, that was a big thing of why I learned recording and music production. But did the, you learn how to play another instrument like the piano or the guitar or something? Yeah, I, I played guitar. Guitar was actually the first instrument I picked up. And then guitar was very much like I had to like learn, like really like learn it. And, uh, you know, but drums, for whatever reason, my, my uncle was a drummer and gave us an old drum kit that was in our garage. And the drums just like made sense to me. Like I, I, I just remember when I was like in the fifth grade, I could just I sat down at the drums and like I could just play them. Like, I I don't know. I didn't, it wasn't something I had to like take lessons and like rigorously like learn. It it just was natural to me on the drums. Whereas guitar was like, you know, the painstaking process of like learning all the chords and figuring that out. So yeah, I totally hear that. Yeah. For some reason, like I just took to bass. It just like suited my, my musicality. You know what I mean? Like, and then, and then, and then it leads you down however your path is going to lead down. (laughs) Oh yeah. Like, yeah. Is, I picked up the guitar because my older brother got a guitar and my parents like rented us one from uh, music and arts like way back in the day. And uh, 
so I would always play his guitar and then my brother, he, he moved over to bass, but I remember I was like such a young age. Like the bass was like too big for me. I was like in the fourth grade or something, you know? So yeah. to me, I wanted, I, I just kept on playing the guitar and my brother switched over to the bass and then, uh, just kind of went from there. <laughs> Family band. Yeah. Wait, so, so I, maybe you already answered this, but like, what do you think like a drummer producer brings to the table the most? Uh, I, I would say probably just, uh, you know, making sure the songs have good groove and rhythms and, and, and the beat is, you know, something I, I feel like, like with human resources, a lot of our music is like kind of like has pop sensibilities and like dance music. And so yeah, sure. just to make sure, you know, it's something you could like groove to or, you know, get a head bob going to. Amazing. So, you know, I'm sure a bunch of the listeners are going to be like people getting started, figuring out how to become a producer or audio engineer or whatever. So, so what's like one thing that you would advise somebody just kind of at the beginning of their career to to, to do or maybe even not do uh, if they want to like pursue a career here? I would just say just just start just do it, like start making things. Um, obviously, you know, like I, I listen back on old recordings and I'm like, oh, man, you know, like but you just have to keep doing it and you'll get better at it. Like. I, the reason I know logic so well is because I've just literally spent f- f- a bajillion hours messing around in it, you know, <laughs> and I still, I still like learn yeah. new things about it sometimes. Like even today, you know, even though I've, I feel like I've surely exhausted every possible feature or thing that is in there, you know, but, and then just have good relationships with people, you know, um, networking is, is big, like knowing the people in your community and, and the other musicians and bands and, um, like I started recording my own songs and and doing the covers and recording my band songs and I used that as a a kind of a portfolio to, to sh- as a body of work that people could listen to and that led to people hearing what I could you know make and and then th- that led to people hiring me to record their stuff so you know if if you want to open a studio or be a, a producer I, I would say you know if if you are a musician yourself or a songwriter you know record your own stuff use that as an example so to speak um and then yeah and then you could show other people and they can they could tune in i love um, that that's amazing yeah yeah so matt how can our audience find you on the internet my instagram is at coast records that's that's probably what i'm on the most um or my website is www.coast-records.com and you know, I'm a, there's a Facebook page and all that as well. All the other, all the other uh, social media situations. It's all there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to definitely going to share that, and I'm definitely going to share some of the music that you sh- you sent me before we started recording because I think it's really cool. I think uh, the audience is going to want to hear it. Killer. So yeah, dude, what a what a pleasure to speak with you and to learn from you and uh, yeah, just to get to know you. I guess. Man, this has been so great. I I literally was talking with Matt Garber. I was like, man, if you guys ever want. Like I was, I was like, I want to go on a podcast. Like if you guys ever have a guest, like, <laughs> let me come on, you know? So I'm, I'm super glad that, uh, that you reached out to him and that he, he recommended me, man. It's been, it's been super cool. It's rare to get Amazing. to talk to someone that like, it was such a bizarre, like, you know, yeah. not many people care about like frequencies and, you know, like panning and stuff. So it's, <laughs> it's fun to nerd out on. Yeah. And that. it's also cool to like see, meet people like all over the world. I feel like for me, like, I don't know, like I didn't even know this is going to be like the best thing about starting a podcast, but just like, you know, opening the doors to meeting so many cool people and like all over the world. And it's just like great to meet other people who do what we do. And I feel like a lot of people that do what we do kind of are isolated in their own box in their bedroom or wherever, and just kind of like working by themselves all the time. And I know that was, that was me at the beginning for sure. And it's just kind of like, you're not alone. Like there's a community, there's other people out there. And like, once you kind of realize that, like, it's just so much easier to kind of go forward in this career. Like, I don't know. I went to, like, I even wrote a blog about this, but I went to AES, uh, I guess it was like two and a half years ago. It was like right before my cousin's wedding. So I was in New York and it was just like, Oh, here are other people that do what I do. And like, it's like, you're so unaware that there are other people doing what, what we do. And it's just, it's just like, we're out there, you know? Oh, yeah. So like, <laughs> like be in touch, you know, I don't know. <laughs> For sure. It's been super cool, man. I'm I'm really pumped that uh, I got to be a part of this with you, man. For sure. I'm so excited. Uh, we'll share this episode, I guess, within the coming weeks. And uh, I'll keep you posted about that. Killer. All right, man. Have a great day and uh, stay safe out there. Thanks, man. You too. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Secret Sonics. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Matt as much as I did. If you enjoyed this episode or any of our other episodes, I'd super appreciate it if you would share it with a friend or two and if you would leave us a rating review on Apple Podcasts. In addition to that, you can find us on social media. Just search for Secret Sonics. We're on Instagram and Facebook. And you can shoot me an email if you want at secretsonics at gmail.com with any feedback, thoughts, or people you might want to recommend to have on the show. Other than that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe. Stay